Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's wonderful to see uh, you here. Can everybody hear me? If not, can you wave at the back? And perhaps could we have the lights up a little bit so that I can see the audience a little bit better? Is that going to be possible? Just a little bit so that I can make sure that you're not all uh, you know, asleep down below. Okay, we're going to do some pirate myth exploding this morning. Um, and I want you all to join my pirate crew, and you will see in front of you, you should all each have a pirate doubloon. You may need that later, so look after it for now. You also should see... <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> you should also see that there are uh, pens and there are labels. I would like all of you in joining the pirate crew to work out what your pirate name is. And you can see that mine, I'm Clary e. Jowett, and my name is Yer Scarlet Hornswag. So I, there are, pass them around, so you need to work out what your name is. Yeah. And stick it on a label. If the older pirates in the room could help the younger pirates it's particularly important that young pirates have their name on a label. I'll give you a minute or two to get your pirate crew together. Okay, if I can have some quiet now, pirate crew. You're going to have time in the lecture to make sure that you've got your pirate label on your lapel. There are cards that have got how to work it out when this slide moves on. So don't worry if you've not got, quite got it sorted yet. But we are going to set sail very, very soon. Go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're going to set sail. So can I have some quiet now, please? Thank you. I also need to introduce you to this morning to somebody that's very important for our journey. Over to my right, this is Captain Blackheart. He is a famous pirate. <laughs> he doesn't say very much, but what he does say is this. Now, boys and girls, when we explode, what we're going to need you to say, Cap uh, Captain Blackheart will say, what will he say? Ah. And what will you say? Ah. Louder, please. What will you say? Ah. Brilliant. Every time you see R ah and you hear Captain, uh, Horns, uh, Captain Blackheart saying it, that's what you're going to have to say. And what we're going to talk about today are these things how long pirates lived, what life was like on a pirate ship, 
What did pirates wear and who became a pirate? And there are lots of myths about, about all these questions. And together, we are going to explode. myths explode some of them. And what will we say when we myths explode? <laughs> Louder. What are we going to say? Thank you. I want that volume. And so to start with, here is a picture of perhaps... Uh, the most popular and instantly recognisable pirate figure of the 21st century. Do you know who this is, boys and girls? Shout it out. Jack yes, excellent. That's right. That's Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, in 2015, a new poll of the 100 greatest film characters of all time placed Captain Jack Sparrow as the 14th on that list. So just in a few years, he's become instantly recognisable. But my first question for myth exploding is, was Jack Sparrow a real pirate? Hands up who thinks he, he was. Was Jack Sparrow a real pirate? Hands up who thinks he wasn't. Oh, I think the nose have it. And you are right. Louder, what do you say? It's a myth. Excellent, excellent. Now, before he played Jack Sparrow, Johnny Depp, uh, seeing parallels between modern rock stars and pirates, decided to model his performance on this man, the legendary guitarist Keith Richards from the band The Rolling Stones. Now, older pirates will know perhaps better than younger who that is notorious for a debauched rock and roll lifestyle. And as you all know, Keith Richards was then cast as Jack Sparrow's father, Captain Teague, in later films in, in, the, in the series. And this is a warning to all young pirates, this is what a debauched lifestyle does to you. <laughs> so... What this shows, then, is the way real-life stories, uh, real life and stories blur when talking about pirates. In other words, Johnny Depp copied uh, this, uh, uh, Keith Richards' mannerisms when playing Sparrow, and then Keith Richards is cast as Sparrow's dad in the fantasy world of Pirates of the Caribbean. So we've got that... that blurring of fact and fantasy. So let's carry on myth exploding together. And this is what we're going to think about, how long pirates lived and what was their life like. So my first question then is, did pirates live a long life? Who thinks they did? Hands up for a yes. <laughs> You're very wise. Hands up for a no. Yes. Ah, brilliant. Life for most pirates was very short and extremely brutal. Few pirates made old bones. This is unlike Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, where he has numerous adventures over many years. In fact, the average length of a pirate's career at sea in the 18th century, when Jack Sparrow is supposed to have lived, was actually about 18 months long. Only 18 months at sea. Now, life was hard on pirate, uh, 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 on, on, on pirate ships, uh, and pirates were surrounded by death. Even Jolly Rogers... And here are a couple of examples. There's a real one in the red that's, that, that survived from the 18th century. And there's a, a, a kind of a pictorial representation of a flag that was flown in the 18th century show that piracy is surrounded by death. And there are lots of designs of, for Jolly Rogers, as well as the skull and crossbones. Here you've got one then with a skeleton spearing a heart while toasting in in rum, I'm sure, the devil. And these flags were meant to frighten a pirate's enemies. And was, what was life like? Do you think life on a pirate ship was one big party with shark baits and lots of nice biscuits? 
Who thinks it was one big party? Hands up for a party. <laughs> we wish, we wish. Sadly, I'm afraid it's a... Oh. Pirates' ships uh, 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 were not places where life was much fun. Life is hard on pirates' ships. Because just like another ship, rather than being a life of pleasure interspersed with fighting, which is what we see in the films and read about in books, pirate life was rough. Uh, pirate life was hard. Pirates only had not that lovely shark bait, but perhaps only one hot meal a day. Fresh food supplies often ran out. Fresh food, of course, was taken on a ship at the beginning of the voyage, but when it was used up, diets mainly consisted of, and this doesn't sound very nice to me, salted fish and salted meat. And also this thing. Does anybody know what this is called? Hands up. Yes, in the hat. Yes, well done. And I think we might have a reward for a young pirate that knows the answer to this. Now, Captain Blackheart is quite mean with his treasure, but when we've got clever pirates, he will give out. Congratulations, young pirates. This is ship's biscuit, and this is a, a hard, twice-baked biscuit that could be kept for a long time, and then hence, of course, was taken on ships. Even though it could be kept for a long time, it wasn't necessarily always a choice item to eat because rats, maggots, weevils often got to the biscuit before the pirates did. So not only was the food not very good, but pirates were often ill. Diseases spread rapidly on cramped conditions on pirate ships. And one of the most common conditions was something called scurvy. And here we've got some pictures from the 18th century of the symptoms of scurvy on some poor person's leg. Um, and this is caused by a lack of vitamin C. It's very unpleasant with a sufferer having bleeding gums and sores, which is what you can see here on this, this poor leg. It results in fever, madness, and then death. So it's pretty brutal on a pirate ship. Um, what we're going to talk about now is what pirates wore. Did they all dress like Cat and Jack Sparrow? And that's what we're going to focus on. I'm just going to whiz back. What did pirates wear? Did they all really dress like this? What do you think? Do you think they all went round looking like Captain Sparrow? Hands up for yes. Hands up for no. Oh, you're getting wise at this. It's absolutely right. Most sailors, including pirates, wore something a bit like this. This is called slops. Nice name. Um, it's a very rare surviving suit of a, of a sailor or pirate shirt and breeches. And this dates back to 1600. Um, and sailors' clothes were loose, you can see here. They were practical, and that reveals a lot about life on board a ship. They're made of strong linen because of all the hard work. And they're nothing like Captain Sparrow's quirky clothes. There's tar across the front of the slop from hauling ropes, showing the work that a pirate would have to do when climbing a ship, uh, the, the, the rigging of a ship like this. Sailors also didn't have uh, the opportunity to wash their clothes or change their clothes. They're really hard to keep on clean on board, and, and pirates are often infested with lice. And sailors sleep, and pirates sleep in their clothes so that they can scramble into action at a moment's notice. And the ships that they're living on, this is a, a, a little diagram of one, and it's only about 25 metres or so long. And a pirate would often be away at sea for weeks at a time. So this is their world. So 
if this is really what a pirate would have worn, where exactly does Captain Jack Sparrow's rather more glamorous and flamboyant look come from? And I'm going to spend a minute or two giving you a couple of possibilities where we can see Jack Sparrow's, uh, uh, the signs uh, rather more, uh, more clearly of his fashion sense. And we're going to start with this chap. Now, this chap is called, as many of you know, I will know, I'm sure, Blackbeard, also known as Edward Teach. And he is a picture, a pirate that's talked about in this book, Captain Charles Johnson's A General History of the Pirates. And this is a book that's first published in 1724. That's nearly 300 years ago. And it's a really important book that did much to create the stereotypical image of what pirates looked like. Still present in Jack Sparrow, and interestingly, nobody knows who Captain Johnson was. It's, it's a mystery. Who wrote this book that started off many of the myths about pirates? A mystery that's yet to be solved. But we do have the story of Blackbeard. And note here Blackbeard's Jack Sparrow-like stance and his eccentric appearance. Captain Johnson, the person that supposedly wrote the general history, said he was, and this is a quote from Johnson, a fury from hell that would, would not look more frightful than Blackbeard. Blackbeard, as you can see, he's tall. He's got broad shoulders. He's wearing knee-length boots uh, and dark clothing. The boots uh, are hidden a bit there. He's topped with a wide hat, and sometimes he is depicted in a, a, a bright coat um, of coloured silk or velvet. And it seems, I think, that Blackbeard understood the value of frightening appearances. Look how well armed he is. He's got a lot of what our Captain uh, Blackheart has, a whole series of pistols there. And he's also got lighted matches stuck under his hat. So all the smoke is coming out, emphasising his fearsome appearance. As like a devil, there's a ring of smoke and fire around his face. So that's one, I think, source for Jack Sparrow's clothes. Here's perhaps another also an old, probably 18th century, picture of a pirate. And note the way this picture tells the story of the pirate's life. In the main picture, he is standing on a huge pile of gold. So he's got lots of what we've got here, lots of lovely gold, and it's obviously very important to him. But look down the sides of the picture. There are scenes of punishment. There's a somebody in the stocks, uh, there's somebody being flogged, uh, there's unnatural greed. Look at that horse, it looks like it's munching on gold in the manger. Note too the host of little devils surrounding the pirate and his activities, and it's clearly supposed to reveal both the life story of the pirate, he's going to come to, to no good, and signal his evil nature. These, this, this picture and the picture of uh, Blackbeard show that pirates are bad people. But in terms of fashion sense, note the flamboyant hats, the long hair, and pirates like long hair. Look at, look at, look at, look at what our pirate is doing with his. Uh, and the dandyish frock coats in all three images of Sparrow, Blackbeard, and this pirate. So Sparrow is not a real pirate, but his clothes do certainly reference the outfits of a number of real pirate captains whose clothes stood out from the standard, plain and practical garments of the regular sailor. It's important, I think, therefore to ask what such dandyish clothes, what such outlandish clothes might mean at the time and where they came from. By choosing to dress in such clothes or by showing a picture of a pirate in a half red and half blue harlequin coat, for instance, what 
is the painter, what is the pirate intending? Of course, clothing is a visual way of signaling a person's station. For pirates, just like everybody else, clothes carry social meaning about rank and about identity. So where your station is in life is shown by what you wear. And this is because fabrics, colours and styles that a person wore in the past were regulated, were ruled by what was called the sumptuary laws. These laws, the sumptuary laws, said that people must wear the clothes of their rank uh, or station and to dress more lavishly was a sin and a crime against the social order. Now, who is this? Hands up. You with the lovely tinsel. Shout, shout it out. Yes, you're all right. Give this girl a round of applause. And I think something a bit more... Oh, well done. Well done. Captain Blackheart is on his way. That is indeed Henry VIII. And Henry VIII, this King of England, forbade anybody below the rank of a knight from wearing garments of velvet or garments embroidered with silk. And penalties for violating these laws included heavy fines or the loss of one's title or property. Even minor fine, uh, indiscretions were fined heavily. Now, who's this? Hands up. Girl with the red in the red. It's who? Oh, well done. Nice round of applause. Captain Blackheart, deliver your treasure. And under Elizabeth I, for instance, in a 1571 Act of Parliament, it was said that uh, on Sundays and on holidays, all common men and boys over six years of age were to wear woolly, woolly hats. Now, how many boys and men over six years have got a woolly hat? Please put it on now if you have. Woolly <laughs> hats on, please. Boys and men over six years. If you don't have a woolly hat, you're about to be fined three farthings. This is an Elizabethan three farthings. Get those hats on. <laughs> Captain Blackheart, shall we find them today? We shall. We shall, right. I will need your three farthings. <laughs> oh, well done. <laughs> a very good hat. Almost a proper pirate hat. <laughs> now, let me tell you what three farthings meant in Elizabethan times. It's quite hard to accurately convert Elizabethan money into modern values, but a skilled labourer in London earned about 8D a day. So three farthings was about 10% of a labourer's income a day. In other words, this is a big fine for a small crime. Pirates who lived outside the law, sometimes acquired articles of clothing from outside their ranks from a ship's cargo that they captured or from their prisoners. To pirates like uh, uh, other laws, the sumptuary laws were meant to be broken. And this is an example of a nobleman called Sir Francis Verney who quarrelled with his family in the early 17th century and he left England to become a pirate in North Africa. And he wore fabulous flamboyant clothes as a pirate fleet commander. And some of these clothes, and that's what you've got here on this slide, have survived, including a richly embroidered purple hat and a coat rimmed in fur and soft slippers. And even the act of wearing purple itself was rebellious, since in 1509, that king that we met a few moments ago, Henry VIII, had decreed that only the king and his close family could wear purple. So Verney, by wearing these lovely purple uh, 
clothes is challenging royal authority just in what he's wearing. Now, of course, pirates were criminals, and when they were captured by authorities, they're going to be tried for their thievery, and they're going to be punished for it by, put in, by being put in jail or by execution by hanging. And here's a 1580 or so depiction of a pirate execution. And the two pirates that are shown being hung here are called uh, uh, Clinton At Atkinson and uh, Thomas Walton, or Purser, as his nickname goes. And when it came to their executions, pirates uh, were known also for wearing their best clothes. And the pirate shown uh, being hung there, Clinton Atkinson, is described by a contemporary as wearing a velvet doublet with great gold buttons at his execution, and also wearing coloured Venetians with great gold lace. And Venetians are trousers. And here we've got Francis Drake in a lovely, lovely pair of Venetians. And if we go back to Purser and Clinton, uh, commentators said that the clothes that they were wearing was apparel too sumptuous for sea rovers. So even in the clothes that they wear when they're killed, they're being rebellious. Of course, it's very difficult to know exactly what pirates from hundreds of years ago wore. Surviving items of clothing like Verney's coat and slippers and, and cap and sailors' slops are very rare indeed hundreds of years later because, of course, cloth is very perishable. However, sometimes miracles do happen, such as the discovery by maritime archaeologists in 2006 of 18th century pirate John King's stockings and his leather shoe with a buckle. And here it is. This is John King's uh, shoe and his stocking. And these finds are important. Now, John King was born in about 1707, and he dies in 1717. So he was about 10 when he died. And this is the youngest ever pirate record on record, only 10 years old. He joins the crew of Samuel, known as Black uh, Sam Bellamy, while he's still only about eight years old. And he's only about 10 when he sadly dies. But while he lived, John was clearly had a very adventurous spirit. When the ship he was traveling on was captured by pirates, he immediately wants to join them. Far from being forced or compelled, says the captain on the ship that he was traveling, um, he declared, John declared, he would kill himself if he was restrained from being a pirate. He even threatens his mother, who was also on board, if she would uh, not let him turn pirate. So John becomes a pirate on Captain Bellamy's ship, and while eight or nine, he's involved in capturing and looting many ships before he's caught in a storm off Cape Cod, and he's shipwrecked. Uh, and most of the crew, including John, are sadly drowned. Now, if you look carefully at the picture of his shoe and his stocking, I think you can see something else there, something a bit more gruesome. Archaeologists in 2006 found an 11-inch fibula, that's the calf bone, still in the stocking which was then looked at by forensic pathologists who determined that, that fibula didn't belong to a small man, as originally thought, but to a boy of approximately John's age. So there we have rather more of, 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 of John than we might think at first glance. So my last topic for today is who became a pirate? Was it only men and boys that became pirates? Who thinks it was? Only men and boys. Hands up. No. no. <laughs> what do we need to do when it's a no? Well done. Brilliant. No, it absolutely wasn't. 
The traditional image of historical pirates is of swashbuckling men, and until recent times, pirate stories have also been seen as adventure stories and tales of daring do to be told to boys, not girls, because they were about teaching boys how to become brave and how to become manly. And this emphasis on pirate stories for boys, for instance, is clear in the novelist Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island from 1883, written in Victorian times. I don't know if you've already seen a film of Treasure Island or read the book or seen it as a play, but it's a thrilling tale of buccaneers and of buried gold. It focuses on the adventures of a young, probably about 13-year-old boy called Jim, and its influence has been enormous on popular perceptions of pirates, including such elements as treasure maps marked with an X, the black spot, which you're given if you're going to come to a bad end, tropical islands, and one-legged pirates. Here we've got him bearing parrots on their shoulder. Now, who's this? Hands up if you know who this is. Somebody from the back. We've got a lovely straight hand just at the end with a boy in a hood. Shout it out. It is. Well done. A round of applause. It's Long John Silver. Well done, Captain Blackheart. He doesn't like giving up his treasure, but as I say, for clever pirates, there is a little reward. So Treasure Island is traditionally considered a coming-of-age story for boys, noted for its, its exciting characters and its swashbuckling action. It's also hardly got any girls or women in it, and those that are there stay at home, and they don't have the adventures like boys. But was this really the case? Did girls really stay at home? Captain Blackheart, no. What does that mean you need to do? <laughs> Captain Charles Johnson's A General History of Pirates introduced many features which later become common in pirate literature. The burying of treasure, the name of the pirate flag, but Johnson also included the story and adventures of two famous real-life pirates, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. And here they are. They are in Captain Johnson's book. And Anne Bonny and Mary Reed both spent their lives disguised as boys uh, because their parents dressed them as boys. And both girls clearly had adventurous spirits. They dressed as sailors and they went to sea. Both turned pirates and they ended up working for the pirate captain Jack Calico Rackham where they become good friends and they reveal themselves to each other to be women. Anne and Mary showed that they could guzzle rum, curse and fight with the best of Calico Jack's male pirates. They played a leading role in a spree of pirate raids in 1720 and they fought really bravely during an attack by pirate hunters sent to capture them. During that attack, Reed is supposed, Mary is supposed to have shouted at the male pirates cowering below decks, if there's a man among ye, you'll come up and fight like the man ye are supposed to be. So the male pirates were useless, the girl pirates were really brave. Nevertheless, Mary and Anne were caught, Calico Jack was executed, but Mary and Anne were spared after both were found to be going to have a baby. Sadly, Mary later came down with a fever and she died in prison, but it's thought that Anne survived as there's no historical record of either her release or her execution. And Captain Blackheart told me that he thinks he's seen Anne Bonny in this theatre this morning. So is there anybody called Anne Bonny here? Oh, I can see somebody. There's Anne Bonny. A round of applause for Anne Bonny, the pirate Anne Bonny. We found her. (laughs) 
And it's thought that Anne Bonny, she's looking very, very well for her 300 years, resumed her life at sea under a new identity. But we've smoked her out this morning. Well done, Anne. Now, Anne and Mary have inspired numerous retellings and stories about female pirates. Who has read here the Piratica series? Has anybody read this? If not, it's a wonderful read because it, it follows the stories of a girl pirate, the 16-year-old Artemisia Fitzwillaby Weatherhouse, that's quite difficult to say, who is an amnesiac. She's lost her memory and she's uh, at the Angels Academy of Young Maidens. And she tumbles down the stairs and she hits her head and that restores her memories of her previous life aboard a pirate ship led by her mother, Molly, a.k.a. Piratica of the title. Sadly, a misfired cannon has caused Molly's death and Art Art Artemisia's amnesia. But from here, it all starts Artemisia's adventures as she sets off to find her mother's pirate crew. Another classic story, Wendy, uh, 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 another classic story is J.M. Barry's novel Peter Pan and Wendy, and that was recently rewritten by uh, a playwright, Ella Hickson, as Wendy and Peter Pan, and performed by the Royal Shakespeare Company. There we've, <coughs> excuse me. There we've got Captain Hook's boat. The story of Peter Pan tells a story of a boy that didn't grow up, and that was written in 1904, and it's about the Darling family and the three children, Wendy, John and Michael, who fly to Neverland to be with, uh, uh, with Peter Pan. There they meet the Lost Boys, who live with Peter, and they fight Captain Hook, who I've just shown you, his ship, and his crew of horrible pirates. <coughs> Now, whilst in Neverland, Wendy pretends to be the mother of the lost boys, and she falls in love with Peter. But as the story comes to an end, Wendy returns home, asking Peter to join her. Peter says no, claiming that he wants uh, to stay as a little boy and to stay having fun. Now, Wendy and Peter Pan retells the story from Wendy's perspective. In the original story, Wendy gets a tough time. All the other girls attack her and she spends most of her time in what's called the home under the ground, putting up curtains, playing mother to the lost boys and trying to get Peter to marry her. But in the new play, Wendy's much tougher and she's the hero of the story. And here we've got her fighting. She's got the sword. In the original, the other girls are jealous of Wendy and in competition with her. And in the end, she's sad and abandoned because Peter leaves her. The retelling challenges and changes the idea that girls have to be jealous of either, each other and compete for attention. Wendy has the adventures. Right, my very, very final point. It returns to Elizabeth I, who we met earlier, and to Francis Drake, who we saw in his Venetian trousers. Sir Francis Drake was the first Englishman to sail round the world in 1577 to 1580. And he's a man that's often credited with saving the English from an invasion by the Spanish in 1588, when England and Spain were at war. So he's often seen as a hero. But he's all, there he is, there he is with his hand on the globe. But he's also a great big pirate. Elizabeth I, who we met earlier, is also, there she is, she's got her hand on the world. This is the Armada portrait. Is also a great big pirate. And in Elizabethan times, England was a small, isolated country, an unimportant backwater in Europe. Spain, in particular, was really rich, as it had 
established an empire in America and was extracting gold and silver from that empire. As a result, Spain was the superpower of the time, dominant in Europe and controlling an empire on which it was said the sun never set. And that means that the sun is always shining in some part of the world that the Spanish owned at the time. It was huge. Elizabeth I tried to change all that. And this is when the English started to express ambitions to compete for territory in America and elsewhere. And the key way that Elizabeth I did this was through piracy. The English kept stealing gold from the Spanish and they were known as a nation of pirates with Francis Drake, who we remember uh, for circumnavigating the world, for being the first English circumnavigator, actually stealing a king's ransom of doubloons, like the one that you've got today in front of you, uh, from the Spanish. So Francis Drake, England's national hero, was also called at the time the master thief of the known world. And Elizabeth I, the English national heroine, took 10% of the gold that Drake stole as her share of the treasure. So to finish with then, who should be called a pirate? What a pirate was very much depends on your own point of view. And this is perhaps the most important point of our myth exploding this morning. To Drake's victims, he was a great big pirate, even though he's celebrated as a national hero and a very brave man. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls.